Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and welcome to Friday Science. Today, I want to have a look at radiometric dating. And I got interested in this due to my work with conspiracy theories, and specifically Rob Shiva's talk at the Flat Earth International Conference in Dallas, Texas. Let's go ahead and see what he had to say. A million years seems like a lot when you throw the number out there as they're fond of doing. However, 50 million years out of 4.6 billion years is less than a 1% discrepancy. That's really not all that bad. Let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version. Geometric dating is the intelligent design argument that's been in in use since probably about the mid-1990s. And I'm going to go ahead and go over this argument and show where it's flawed and how they actually misrepresent it. So cue up the music and let's go. Well, welcome back. Now let's go ahead and look into this argument a little bit more. Now remember, their argument is that you have to use this imaginary form of science called historical science to make assumptions. Now, in order to make this argument work, they have to try and plant the seed that somehow radioactive decay was different in the past. Let's see where that argument breaks down. One of the things that you have to assume is that this is the only hourglass that we have ever seen. Now, if we had this hourglass along with 20 other hourglasses of different sizes, and we compared the amount of time that those hourglasses indicated had passed, and they're all in agreement, what are the chances are that this hourglass had sand in the bottom of it, or somehow the rate of drip of the sand changed during that time? It's very unlikely. And that's the way radiometric dating works. We can use a variety of substances to do radiometric dating. Let me show you. Now here's the basic principle behind radiometric dating. We have uh, a parent and a daughter element. An example would be uranium and lead that start off in a rock. Now you start off with 100% uranium in the rock when it cools and then as time goes on that uranium will decay to lead. Now the time that it takes half of the uranium to decay is called the element's half-life. So if you start off with a sample that has 100 atoms of uranium in it, at the end of one half-life, you will have 50 atoms of uranium and 50 atoms of lead. And yes, we can count them. At the end of two half-lives, you will have 25 atoms of uranium and 75 atoms of lead. That's the way half-lives work. And as you can see with this graphic right here, it's pretty well explained. There's a couple of really interesting things about radiometric dating. It's only good for about 10 to 15 half-lives of the element that you're testing. Okay, let's go over a problem that we have with radiometric dating. Say we take an element, uh, we're going to use uranium and lead just for argument's sake, and, I, and these numbers are just being used for an example. Less than 5% of the uranium has gone on to lead. We can't reliably measure a date based on that because of errors in measurement, etc. Now, between 5% and 95% of uranium going over to lead, we can get a really good date line. As you can see here, it's a nice fat part of the curve. At the last 5% of the uranium going to lead, we may not be able to measure that accurately enough to be able to give us a very specific date. We'll, we can just say that it is older than this. So there's a limited range that you have to get a really accurate radiometric date. Now, where does that come into play? Let me show you. So if you have a look at this chart, you can see that something like carbon-14, which is the parent element, going to nitrogen-14, which is the daughter element, the half-life for that is 5,730 years. That would be very nice to try and measure something that's 20,000 years old, for example. However, look up at potassium and argon. The half-life there is 1.25 to 1.3 billion years. Here's a question for you. If you wanted to date something that was 1,000 years old, which of these two, the carbon-14 or the potassium, 
would you choose to date that? The other problem that you're going to run into is say you want to date something like a diamond. Now, a diamond is a very old piece of material. Would you use something with a short half-life like carbon-14 to date that diamond, knowing that you couldn't accurately date it out more than, say, 40,000 years? Or would you use something like the potassium to argon with a half-life of 1.3 billion years? You'd obviously use something like potassium to argon because the half-life of the carbon-14 is simply too short. Let's see how they took advantage of this to try and deliberately mislead people. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. Now eventually, lava flows formed a new dome, five new domes actually, all of which were destroyed by subsequent eruptions. But the sixth dome that formed between October 1980 and 86 is what you see today. It's composed of 2.6 billion cubic feet of lava, and it's quite young, having finished forming just over 30 years ago. Well, in 1996, geologists sent rocks from the lava dome to be radiometrically dated. Now, they used a method called potassium argon. Well, scientists measured how much potassium and how much argon are in the rock, and they calculate the age of the rock, right? But creation scientists have pointed out for years that there are some major problems with radiometric dating. One big one is all of the assumptions that it's grounded on. You must assume that the half-life is constant and that it never varies. You have to assume that there was no contamination. For example, no argon was present in the sample before the decay began. Well, that's a lot of unprovable assumptions. Now, did anybody notice the trick? Do you see how he just went over the radiometric dating very quickly and then immediately launched into his arguments about, oh, we can't tell how radioactive decay was. We don't know what the sample had. We don't know what the initial conditions were. And since we can't know these things, there's no way that we can understand the actual age of rocks. Therefore, the Earth is 6,000 years old because that's the ages listed in the Bible. That's the entire argument of young earth creationism. But let's go ahead and look back and see what kind of radiometric dating they used for this. This is an object that is only 30 years old. Potassium argon. Now, if you're going to date something that's only 30 years old, is potassium argon the dating method that you want to use? Well, let's just remind ourselves of what the half-life of potassium argon is. Well, I don't know about you guys, but to date a 30-year-old rock, I don't think that I'd want to use an element that has a half-life of 1.25 to 1.3 billion years. As a matter of fact, carbon-14 at almost 6,000 years would be a little long. That's only a tiny fraction of one half-life. Now the problem that arises is what I talked about earlier. Even though you clean up the samples, there's always a little bit of contamination. There's some measurement error in the sensitivity of the instrument. If there's only a tiny amount of the parent element converted to the daughter element right at the beginning of the cycle, you're not going to get an accurate reading. If you are beyond, say, 15 or 20 half-lives, you're not going to get an accurate reading. You certainly would not want to use an element that has a 1.25 billion year half-life to try and, and date a rock that's only a couple of years old. This was deliberately misleading, and they falsified the evidence to the lab telling them that they suspected the rock was considerably older. And when the lab found out that it was a rock from Mount St. Helens, and they were using their name on this rock, giving a date of 350,000 years, 
they told them specifically that not only were they misled about the age of the rock, but that was an inappropriate radiometric dating method to test a rock that young. It would definitely give a false result because it was such a short period of time relative to the half-life of the method that these people, Dr. Austin specifically, requested, giving information to the lab suggesting that the rock was suspected to be much older. They hid the origin of the rock to deliberately come up with a false test. You know, I find it ironic that Rob Skiba titled his talk, Testing the Globe, Who Really Has the Intellectual High Ground? Well, the answer is the globe does, because the flat earth and young creationism is intellectually dishonest. And this is a good example of the dishonesty that they perpetuate. This is intellectual dishonesty because they are counting on their viewers not picking up on the fact that potassium argon has a half-life of 1.3 billion years. And it is completely inappropriate to test a decade-old rock with something that has a half-life of 1.3 billion years. You want something that is considerably shorter. Now, if radiometric dating and the assumptions that it's founded on were accurate, well then Mount St. Helens rocks should have yielded very young ages. After all, the rock was merely about a decade old. You see, the problem is they didn't. The rock gave an age of 350,000 years. When they dated the minerals within the rock, the problem got much worse. They gave dates of 2.4 million years. This is for a 10-year-old rock. Now, Mount St. Helens highlighted that we shouldn't blindly trust the dates given by radiometric dating. The assumptions clearly aren't accurate, so the dates that they give are also inaccurate. Instead of trusting a method that doesn't even give correct ages for rocks of known age, well, maybe we should trust the Bible's history, which tells us that our Earth is around 6,000 years old. Now here's the problem that you run into with science. One of the tenets of science is, is that you report your data accurately. You don't attempt to mislead others with your data or your samples. You don't tell a radiometric lab that the rock is millions of years old or suspected to be millions of years old when you know that it is less than 10 years old. And then you don't ask them on a 10-year-old rock to use a radiometric dating method that has a half-life of 1.3 billion years. You don't see any of that in this documentary. What you see is them sitting down claiming that the Earth is 6,000 years old based on the results of this radiometric isotope testing. That's misleading. That is intellectually dishonest. And they deliberately did it, glossing over the method that they used in an attempt to mislead people that are watching YouTube videos and don't know any better. But you know better now. Now the purpose of doing this test using, uh, using a young rock of known age and the wrong test to test it was to be able to declare, as it says right here in the, in the article, that therefore all radiometric testing is wrong. Well, no, all radiometric testing is not wrong. Your radiometric testing was wrong because you used the wrong rock sample with the wrong test and you misled the lab. And then you went against their recommendations for how to test that rock. You failed on that test and you failed due to intellectual dishonesty and an attempt to deceive a laboratory with a falsified sample. That's that. So. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. I hope that you found this enjoyable and learned something from it. I'll attach uh, links to the papers in the description. Once again, take a moment, hit that little like and subscribe button down there. I do appreciate having you guys on Team Bob, and we'll have more science next Friday. Take care, guys.